Today is the fourth Sunday after Easter. It is also the feast day of St. Stanislaus. And so the second oration of the Mass today is taken from the Mass on the feast day of St. Stanislaus, bishop and martyr. I thank those who took part in our little May crowning procession today. God bless them. And God bless those who prepared the children to crown our Blessed Lady symbolically. Of course, we have to crown her not only in plaster and flowers, we have to crown her, we have to crown her in our hearts as indeed our Blessed Mother given to us by our Lord from the cross itself. And we ask our Blessed Mother to watch over us and our loved ones. We realize that our country is dedicated to her under the title of the Immaculate Conception, and so we consecrate our entire country to her care. Now notice that tomorrow is the Feast of the Apparition of St. Michael the Archangel, and on Saturday we have the Feast of St. Robert Bellarmine. Great, great feast days indeed, so I encourage you to be here for Mass on those days. And of course, We have Mother's Day coming next Sunday. I will not be here, but I do in advance wish all of our mothers a very blessed Mother's Day. May God indeed reward you for all the sacrifices you make to give him life. Now, the public rosary scheduled for the courthouse will still, still take place, but not at the courthouse. The weather reports have been so grim and uncertain, even the, even the forecasters are saying that they really can't predict what will happen so much, or at least the timing, that it seemed very prudent to say, we'll have the rosary here at the church. The rosary will be prayed here at the church at two o'clock. We need the rosary, heaven knows. We prayed here before the Blessed Sacrament at two o'clock this afternoon. The dire weather reports with lightning and thunder and possible tornado warnings they were talk and talking about last night, compounded by the plans to have the marathon through Cincinnati, and I understand from people that it makes it very difficult to, to get around the city. And so the rosary will be here before the Blessed Sacrament in our own church at 2 o'clock this afternoon. Please let everyone know, you know, needs to know that. Now, remember your Easter duty, the obligation of everyone to be a Catholic, a practicing Catholic, to receive our Lord worthily in Holy Communion during the Easter time. And we know that that concludes on Trinity Sunday, which is June 4th of this year. So please do whatever is necessary to be able to receive our Lord worthily during this time. Now also, on this coming Feast of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, which will be on June 16th, we'll have a special observance in honor of the Sacred Heart and the Kingship of our Lord on that date, so please be aware of that and be prepared for that. More information will be coming. We congratulate Siobhan Knox, one of our students, who will be representing not only our church and school, representing the Cincinnati right to life, but also the state of Ohio itself at the national competition, the pro-life oratorical contest. Uh, Siobhan won the first place in the contest yesterday in Columbus and will be going to the national competition very soon. And I thank all of our students who took part in that. They prepared well their speeches. They were very well done. And I know that they will not only win contests, but they will save lives and souls, most importantly, save souls by their zeal for God's honor and the, the blessing of the souls that God made in his own image and by grace in his likeness. So congratulations to you. Now, the rummage sale for the camp will take place June 9th and 10th. Thank you for your help with that. And there will be a food drive taking place here. We know there is a great deal of hardship out there right now. 
and food is expensive, and even the, the food banks are saying that they're having a hard time keeping up with the need. Families are trying to feed their, their little ones, and we should try to help. Our Lord gave us the, the seven spiritual, but also the seven corporal works of mercy. And uh, the first of those is to feed the hungry. So uh, I ask you to please be willing to chip in, as it were, uh, to bring uh, cans of food here to the church. I will have a res means of receiving them in the future. I'll get you more information soon about that. But we want to begin amassing a good supply of food to send over to help those in need. So please pitch in, as it were. And uh, also, I had got word from our Immacul Immaculate Heart of Mary Church in Montana, uh, you know, Father Martin Skierke is the priest in charge there. And one of our dear expatriate parishioners, Mary Cook, is leading the Purgatorian Society effort there. And part of that is raising funds by raffling a beautiful antique statue of Our Lady of Victory. And so uh, there'll be more information forthcoming about this as well for those who can contact Mary directly, feel free to contact Mary Cook directly about that. But I'll be posting the information she sent, and I encourage you to help out in every way you can. <clears throat> Please do keep in your prayers all of the dear souls we know who are in need of prayers, all of those in the American Heart of Mary prayer list. Please remember them. Please uh, um, remember in particular Mr. Riley, and Mr. Wright and so many other good souls we know who are very seriously in need of prayers. Please remember a number of special intentions today. And uh, consult your bulletin for the rest of the information, if you would. Now the epistle for this, the fourth Sunday after Easter, is taken from the epistle of St. James, chapter 1, verses 17 to 21. Dearly beloved, every best gift and every perfect gift is from above coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no change nor shadow of alteration. For of his own will hath he begotten us by the word of truth, that we might be some beginning of his creatures. You know, my dearest brethren, and let every man be quick to hear, but slow to speak and slow to anger. For the anger of man worketh not the justice of God. Wherefore, casting away all uncleanness and abundance of malice with meekness. Receive the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. Please stand for the Holy Gospel. The Gospel is taken from that according to St. John, chapter 16, verses 5 to 14. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. At that time, Jesus said to his disciples, I go to him that sent me, and none of you asketh me, whither goest thou? But because I have spoken these things to you, sorrow hath filled your heart. But I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go. For if I go not, the paraclete will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he is come, he will convict the world of sin and of justice and of judgment, of sin because they believe not in me, and of justice because I go to the Father and you shall see me no more, no longer, and of judgment, because the prince of this world is already judged. I have yet many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. But when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will teach you all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but what things soever he shall hear, he shall speak. And the things that are to come, he shall show you. He shall glorify me, because he shall receive of mine and shall show it to you. Thus far the words of today's Holy Gospel. Please be seated. But I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. My dear faithful, the passage from today's gospel comes from that according to St. John. You know that St. John is the only one of the evangelists 
who gave us a detailed account of our Lord's words to his apostles at the Last Supper. It's called the Discourse, Jesus' Discourse to his apostles. And we find here the end, toward the very end of that discourse, which takes up almost one quarter of St. John's entire gospel. Chapters 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17 are all about that discourse of our Lord, what our Lord told his apostles at the Last Supper. Well, here we come to the middle of chapter 17, toward the end, just before they pray and go their way to Gethsemane, our Lord says these words to his apostles. He talks about the fact that he is going to be leaving them. Now, of course, they do not understand what he is saying at the time. He knows that they do not understand. They make it very clear. They, they do not understand what is coming, but they know something is coming. Something is coming to pass, something difficult, something sorrowful. At that night's supper, our Lord tells him that that night he would be betrayed by one of them. He tells St. John, it is the one who reaches into the dish with him, and it is Judas. So the apostles are well aware that there is something happening, something catastrophic, something magnificent at the same time. When these men sat down with our Lord, and when they were told by him that they would not be seeing him very soon, they would see him again, though. And he tells them in the gospel today that he would be leaving them. They were filled with sadness. Do you think they were sad because they loved our Lord? Yes, certainly. There was a certain love for our Lord in them. Do you think they had faith in him? Yes, they did have a certain faith in him. But time and time again, our Lord remonstrated against their lack of faith, how little faith they really had. That would soon be tested to its limits. Do you think these men were honorable men? Do you think they really had nobility of soul? When they reclined with our Lord at the Last Supper, when they poured partook of that Last Supper with him, when they even received First Holy Communion from his own hand, do you think that they were honorable men? Well, we see what happens, what happens next, what happens in the hours that come after the Last Supper. We see our Lord leading them to the Garden of Gethsemane and warning them, telling them, and my soul is sorrowful even unto death. Peter bombastically announcing that he would go to die with our Lord if necessary that very night. And our Lord prophesying to Peter, sadly, that before the cock crowed, symbolizing the dawn of the next day, Peter would already have denied our Lord three times. Three times. Do you think that Peter was an honorable man at this time? Was he honorable when he drew the sword and took the swipe at the high priest's servant, cutting off his ear, and our Lord told him to put the sword away? And then Peter ran into the darkness with the rest of them. He was brave with a sword in his hand, but he was unfortunately not courageous in soul. His courage was in his sword, not in his soul. And he ran and hid until he appeared there by the fire at the judgment of our Lord, where he denied him, basely denied him three times. Was this honorable? Was this the work of an honorable man? Was this the work of a noble soul? Or the rest of the apostles? Did we see that nobility of character in them? We have to say no. We have to say that they did not conduct themselves as honorable men. What does that mean to be an honorable man? To be truly a noble man? What does that mean? 
Well, we have a motto at the school, Fides et Honor, faith and honor. So we invoke the word honor in our, in our crest, and we want to inculcate two things in our students, faith and honor. They are not the same. We want to give them the, the virtue of faith, we want to increase their virtue of faith, we want to give them a true knowledge of the faith, the teachings of the faith. But none of this would avail to save them were they not also honorable. We want, therefore, not only to give them faith by the example and word that we have to offer them, we want them to be faithful. We want them to have fidelity. Honor and fidelity go together. To have faith and to be faithful are two different things. To have fidelity means to be honorable in that you practice your belief, you profess your faith, and you practice it. That is what it is to be honorable. The apostles might have professed their faith in our Lord, but they certainly did not practice it that night. It was too weak. They did not conduct themselves as honorable men. St. John, the apostle, whose gospel we read today, is the only one who could claim that title of showing nobility and honor under that, those circumstances. You know, it is said of Julius Caesar that he, he died at the hands of his own friends, trusted friends. That is true. The great Caesar whose grave our, some of our students witnessed and, and visited actually just a few weeks ago. A mound of earth with no particular honor to it now covers the ashes of the great conquering hero, Caesar. And Caesar was murdered by his friends, at least one trusted friend in particular. And the betrayal by that friend was such a dreadful thing, it was considered so dastardly, such a betrayal that it has come down to us through time as symbolic and representative of all such betrayals of friendship. The term Treason really applies to Brutus, Brutus, the friend of Caesar, who used his friendship even perhaps to lure Caesar to his death on the portico of the theater of Pompeii on the Ides of March. There, it was also Brutus's hand that was bloodied as Brutus's sword Brutus's dagger pierced the body of his friend Caesar. When Mark Anthony later stood up on the rostrum within sight of the pyre where Caesar's body was being cremated, he gave Caesar's funeral oration. You, wrote, you know it, at least it is portrayed for us by Shakespeare, friends, Romans, and countrymen, lend me your ears. During that funeral oration for Caesar, Mark Anthony, who was truly Caesar's friend, said, we have come, I have come to bury Caesar, not to praise him. And yet, Mark Anthony went on to talk about Caesar's generosity to the common people of Rome, who saw Caesar as a champion. And then Mark Anthony went on to speak of those who killed him as noble men. Noble men, he called them. Although he wasn't really calling them noble, he was referring to them as noblemen. Noblemen. They were members of the aristocracy, and they did not have any nobility in them. They were noblemen the enemies of the common people, or so they seemed. 
and it is then that they rose up to avenge the death of Caesar. There's a difference between being a nobleman in the eyes of the world and being a noble man. Nobility, nobility of character, nobility of soul. That is what matters. And what is left of a man when he loses his honor? When a man betrays his friends, his loved ones, when a man fails to care for his family, when he turns on them and betrays them, <clears throat> and then basely he maybe even blames them for his own failures. These are not the deeds of a noble man. You know that. The world knows that. Because a noble man, a noble man makes a commitment thoughtfully and when he makes a commitment to his wife, to his children, to his friends, to his country, to his church, he keeps that commitment. He would rather die than betray it, than fail to keep his word. This is what true nobility is. It is a matter of being faithful. It is fidelity to God, to country, fidelity to family, fidelity to one's own word. The statement, to thine own self be true, is correct only if one is true to his God. If only one is true, only if one is true to what is right and good. Now, were the apostles these noble men when they reclined with our Lord at the Last Supper? Well, in light of what happened shortly thereafter, we would have to say they were not really noble men. Our Lord had begun his work in them, and yet they seemingly were far from being finished in accomplishing God's work in them. So our Lord tells them that it is expedient for them that he go now because it is necessary for the Holy Ghost to come to complete the work, to finish their character, to make them indeed noble men. And when we see the Holy Ghost come to them, we see what an enormous transformation comes over them. We see them come out of the upper room, filled with zeal. Peter, the man who denied our Lord, now professes him openly to all those gathered in Jerusalem. We are preparing for that moment of Pentecost. Oh, we see that the weakness was still there. We see Peter, later on, acting not so nobly and having to be corrected by Peter. But even there, Peter having to be corrected by Paul, even there, it is part of a noble man's character to make a mistake, but also to admit it, to acknowledge it, to repent of it. And Peter showed that he had that nobility of character that he could acknowledge that he was wrong and admit that it was his fault and repent and change. That's all part of a noble character. My dear faithful, it's important for us to follow in the line of the apostles in our faith, but also important for us to overcome our weaknesses and our infidelity. We have to learn from the apostles what it is to be faithful. We have to be formed by the Holy Ghost in that fidelity. And we see the power of the Holy Ghost in taking even the weakest of men and making him an honorable man. We see the power of the Holy Ghost to do exactly that. As we approach Pentecost, as we approach by way of the ascension of our Lord, where he fulfills the word that he gave his apostles today, <clears throat> that he has taken from their sight, he goes to send us the Holy Ghost anew. And I ask you to please open your hearts to receive that divine influence, that divine influence that alone can make a poor, miserable, sinful man truly a noble man, an honorable man. God bless you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.